Punks. I'm your host, Brett R. Smith. Let's welcome our guests. Joining us today, Lisa Di, pa- Lisa Di Pasquale, Thaddeus McConnor, Matt Palumbo, and Chris Barron. So this is like basically a red eye reunion. This is very cool. It's great to have everybody back. And welcome back, McCotter. I, ha- I had to say it. You know, I had to. It was is that the cool. first time you've ever heard that? In about 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, I, I, I'll, I'll point out that uh, uh, Red Eye was never brave enough to have Lisa and I on at the same time. So. <laughs> really? Well, any of the three of us. Just, or have yeah. y'all been on together? Uh, I don't know if Thaddeus and I would have been on together before. I don't, I don't think so. No. I think they, they keep all of us, they kept all of us really good people apart. And they, like, they, used, they let Ann and I on until that was a disaster for them. And so they separated Coulter and I, too. So. <laughs> I don't remember that one. Why was it a disaster? I got bleeped for saying the word erection. Really? Um, really? Yeah. It's not a disaster that the two of y'all were together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess it's the context. If you were talking about maybe a new building going up, you could use that That's term. They, told me. they said it was the way I said erection. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or if it was a commercial. <laughs> Unreal. All right. Well, let's start off with uh, uh, some topical news, some new stuff. We got Maxine Waters traveling across state lines, calling for more riots, calling for more violence, calling for more confrontation. I, I was disappointed that she didn't say the, the two words gasoline station when she was talking about this. I, I always love that quote because she always sounds ridiculous when she's confront them at a gasoline station. It's like, who, who calls it that anymore? Somebody who like pumped gas maybe like 30 years ago. Um, and then, and then, and then she's also interfering in the Derek Chauvin uh, trial. She's she's calling for no manslaughter. She wants murder, murder in the first degree. She doesn't. She says she doesn't care if it's murder in the second degree, but she just wants murder. And um, I'm just sitting here thinking, does this present an opportunity for a potential mistrial when you've got an elected member of Congress, like I said, traveling across state lines, uh, inciting riots, and also now influencing. Uh, potentially a jury. Well, speaking of incitement, I know this is kind of tangential to what you were saying, but there was a report just a few hours ago that someone opened fire at members of the National Guard in Minnesota. Um, we all know, and I know this is so cliche to say, imagine if the other, you know, imagine if we did it, what the reaction would be, but imagine, mm-hmm. if, you know, I, I mean, we're in a stage right now where if you were to, if you were to merely criticize someone who happens to be Asian, they would bring up anti-Asian hate crimes, and you, obviously those two things are not linked. This is a case where those two things could arguably be linked, and yet there's going to be no one in the media is going to go, hey, isn't it weird that she called for violence, and then a few hours later there was violence? There's going to be none of that, none of that reflection. Um, there's going to be you know, nothing about whether or not it calls a mistrial or, or, or a political rhetoric, but she gets away with it because she's a Democrat. Hey, hey, where's, where's, where's Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney? And Adam Schillinger, shouldn't they be out there lighting themselves on fire talking about how this is a call for insurrection and we must do something about it? Like, meanwhile, like literally Liz Cheney tweeted out this thing earlier today where she was like, Republicans have long been against racism and this and that and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like literally one of your colleagues is calling for violence in the streets in Minneapolis. And you think you think that what you need to be doing is virtue signaling all the rest of the like never Trump a holes on the planet. I, I am like, I am so over all of these people. If if Liz Cheney had any balls, which she doesn't, and if Mitt Romney had any balls, which he doesn't, if they cared a little bit about this inciting riots, then they would be screaming at the top of their lungs about how what Maxine Waters is doing today is putting lives in jeopardy. But the fact is, they don't give a crap. That is, did you ever have any run-ins with Maxine Waters? Uh, no, we're on financial services together, but not not particularly. Uh, to Brett's question, is the jury sequestered, I suppose, is, is the question, because they will not be able to hear any of this or come across any of this, so it will prevent a mistrial. If she's influencing a jury that's not sequestered, that's a huge problem. It is a potential mistrial. What's what's fascinating is the fact that she feels entitled to be able to do this. Because what we've seen is, and especially some of the some of the ominous things we hear about critical race theory being used to the military and other places, they're trying to distinguish this as somehow this is normalized violence. This is okay. Mm-hmm. And it is not okay. Political violence of any stripe is not okay, especially in a free republic. So, well, I think the why of why she or you know anyone else on the Democratic side 
feels that they can do this is because they know they'll get complete cover from the media. Correct. Yes. I, I mean, what would you do if you knew you could get complete cover? Well, um, I wouldn't do this. I would not do this. <laughs> but what they're seeing is, I think it just makes the point, is that we heard all about this uh, in, in what, the fall of last year, that somehow this is Donald Trump's America. That was not Donald Trump's America. That was a trailer for Joe Biden's America. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking at right now. And it was well, very concentrated, like in the, the blue cities. Well, and, and by the by the way, let's not let's not forget that Democrats stripped Marjorie Taylor Greene of her committee assignments for far less than what Maxine Waters did yesterday. And by the way, Maxine Waters has been pushing baseless conspiracy theories for her entire elected life. Go back 20, 30 years. She was telling people that the CIA was secretly selling crack cocaine to black people in Los Angeles to get them addicted. She was blue theory, and on before anyone knew. <laughs> the, 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 the CIA was injecting black babies with the AIDS virus. Like, by the Democrats' own standard, shouldn't she have been stripped of her committee assignments? Which, by the way, she's the chairwoman of one of the most powerful committees on the entire planet, the Financial Services Committee. Like, this is this is not some random backbencher like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah, what's... Uh... What's Ke what's Kevin McCarthy going to do about that? About this? What's Republicans going to do about this? I, I know Kevin. I know Kevin has like zero power. But let's say Kevin gets back into power and he's Speaker of the House. Um, you know, frankly, I want to see a Speaker of the House that's going to exact retribution on Democrats at this point. I, I want I want them stripped of committee hearings. I don't want I don't want this power sharing crap. If Republicans get back into power, they should take power because um, if. You know, I, I quoted Dallas a couple weeks ago with regard to COVID, Jock Ewing, you know, real power isn't something that's given to you. Real power is something you take. And I'm just tired of this. I, this, I, I want tit for tat. I want an eye for an eye. I want Republicans to man up. You know, they probably could do something at this point to Maxine Waters, but I don't see, I don't think they got the stones to do it. And I know for one thing, Kevin McCarthy, it's like one of these guys that wants everybody to like him. I mean, he's, he's like that class president that you you grew up with, you know what I mean? He won't even do, he won't even do anything to, to, to Liz Cheney. What makes you think he's going to have the stones to go after Maxine Waters or anybody on the Democratic side? He literally is allowing somebody who is in the minority of the minority of the minority of the minority of the Republican Party be second in command in the House. Like, yeah. he's up for her. And by the way, she's continued to make a clown of him. Well, by continuing her anti-Trump like tirades over and over and over and over again, she's humiliating him at every turn. He didn't have the stone to say to Liz Cheney, "By the way, you're free to vote your conscience, vote whatever you want, vote however the donors in Wall Street want you to vote for whatever reason you're going to vote that way. Fine, but you don't have the God-given right to be second in charge in the caucus." In the Republican Party. So if he's not if he's not willing to, to stand up to Liz Cheney, why on earth do we think he's going to stand up to Maxine Waters or anybody in the Democratic Party? Yeah. And I mean, I think this is like an even greater enemy, too, would be big tech. And I, I only you know bring that up to say, you know, big tech's been silencing us for God knows how many years. They talk about it all the time. And then what's the solution? Well, we, we have a hearing. They zoom in the Twitter and Facebook CEO. They yell at them for two hours. We get a few sound bites and then nothing happens. Um, you know, I, I think it was the second hearing with Jack Dorsey where they finally got him to apologize for the, the New York Post censorship, which was months after that was already resolved on its own. Yeah. It's like, there's, no, there's no power. We just complain and then I, I don't even know what else. He's like, he's like, yeah, I, I wouldn't have done that if I had to do it all over again. It's, it's like, well, that's great. You know, like, the Hunter Biden quote where he's like, yeah, I did nothing wrong. I mean, I wouldn't do it again, but there was nothing wrong there. It's just zero consequences for any of these people. And, and it's true. I mean, uh, you know, I, I just I want to see somebody new. I want to see some fresh blood. I'd love to see Steve Scalise, frankly, as as Speaker of the House. Um, you know, somebody who's an actual fighter. I, I just look at it's like I said, I look I look at McCarthy and I just see somebody who wants to have his cake and eat it, too. You know, he wants to, you know, keep Liz Cheney in his good graces and then also keep the Freedom Caucus and the MAGA people and everybody else. I mean, it's just, it's bullshit. He joined the people on the left that like freaked out on that Anglo whatever committee that uh, Marjorie was going to start. And like, they all focus on the people that they like European buildings, like as if that's some damning indictment of their cause. It was just very bizarre seeing them sort of accept the left's uh, 
framing when it came to that. Yeah, I don't know what happened to Chris. But... Fruition, but... Mm -hmm. Hopefully, he went to get it. What's that? He said, hopefully, he went to get his dog. Yeah, I don't know. I, I heard something in the background, so I don't know if he had to go and do something. But anyway, he, he'll, if he comes back, I'll add him back in. I want to hear Thaddeus. I mean, like, Thaddeus, I'm really curious about the inner politics of, like, this committee type of stuff. I mean, is this just sort of, like, as minority leader or majority leader either way, I mean, is this something they just kind of have to do? Like, it doesn't happen? Well, no, with Kevin, Kevin's far more competitive and far more Republican than he gets credit for. You have to remember, Liz Cheney's there because of a vote of the conference. They mm -hmm. voted to let her stay there. It was put to a vote. Um, I agree with you. I don't think she should be communicating for the Republican Party. I think she falls into a lot of traps that the left lays out. It's not very helpful, and it causes division amongst the party. The Republican caucus is uh, in back. I think every, there was no dissent from it that you don't throw people off their committees for their views. Mm -hmm. In the Marjorie Taylor Greene situation, I think they were right to do that. It was a power play by the Democrats. It was damaging to the institution. And it should not be reprised by the Republicans. But what they should do is make sure that individuals who've leaked information, such as Adam Schiff and others, uh, are not put back on the Intelligence Committee and things like that, whereby you have actual misfeasance as opposed to a different point of view uh, for people being removed from their committees. Uh, the damage that the leaks that came out of the Democratic Caucus on the Intelligence Committee, as Devin Nunes will tell you, they were very damaging to not only to the investigations that were ongoing, but very damaging to the country as a whole and the trust of people in the institution itself. So those are concrete reasons for having people removed from their committee. But just a simple difference of opinion is really between the member of Congress and their elected and the people who elect them. But here, here's here's my here's my challenge. And this is this is the difficulty for me. I feel like we're the only side that ever fights with one hand tied behind our back. That the, the the left is willing to do any and everything. They don't they don't care. We're the ones going. We have to respect the norms. We have to respect the uh, like history. We have to respect tradition. We can't degrade the institution like that. They're talking about packing the court, blowing up the filibuster. They're removing members for no other reason. Marjorie Taylor Greene got elected with everybody in mm -hmm. her district knowing her opinions. They stripped her of committees for having not for anything she did from the time she got elected. For stuff she said before she got elected, like, like this is all ridiculous. And like, I agree with you, Congressman. Like, I like, I, I don't want us to be the ones initiating this. But on some level, they're not going to stop until they know that there is a penalty for them doing this. Like, if they want to strip, if they want to strip Marjorie Taylor Greene of her committee assignments for pushing conspiracy theories, fine. Then when we get in power, we ought to strip. Uh, uh, Maxine Waters for doing the exact same thing. And we can say, hey, by the way, we're done. If you want to continue to do this, we can do the tit for tat forever. But we're not going to- They'll gonna... never stop. Well, then they'll never stop. Gonna... they'll never stop. What's going to stop them? What, like, I mean, the sure. idea of, of packing the court was something that was so outlandish two yeah. years ago. And now it's a mainstream idea. Like- what? It's, what can we do? A, it's a mainstream amongst progressive Democrats. It is not mainstream with Americans. It is certainly not mainstream with the Republican Party. So what you're looking at is a situation where I'm not them. And ultimately what's going to happen is the ultimate arbiter of the American people and the American people are going to stop them. If you think about it, one of the things that is often overlooked is you saw the Time Magazine article where they talked about all the things they did to fortify democracy and short rig the vote. Look at all the things that they did, the corporations, the media, the censorship, big tech, Zuckerberg with his money and everything else. And they managed to, what, get 50-50 in the Senate because we screwed up Georgia. We won seats in the House despite them. And we can go into what happened to President Trump. But a lot of that was because they didn't stop the things ahead of time uh, with, the, with the lawyers and everything else. This is a party that has no future. The Democratic Party has no future. The only thing that we can do to facilitate them, continue to perpetuate them, is to act like them. The country's tired of them. They're, if they're tired of them, then why is the Fortune 500 companies bowing to them? The fact is that they've made a, they've made a calculation and they believe that it's actually beneficial for them to kiss the left's ass on this stuff, they they they, they don't they don't care. Like if, if we're like, here's the thing. And I, I heard a, a friend of mine give this great speech about how 
essentially conservatives, we're now dissidents in this country. Mm -hmm. Like we are, we are essentially where the dissidents in Eastern Europe were in the seventies and eighties. We're not, we're not the, we're not the like freedom fighters. We're, we're dissidents. Like they, they control everything. And we have to start recognizing the fact that it's not just going to magically get better. If it was, we wouldn't have seen what happened with a hundred of you know the, the the top Fortune 500 companies signing on to a you know a complete and total left wing political statement. Like, where are we winning? Well, well you're including ben, ben and Jerry's in those places. A lot of them were still with the fortified democracy. A whole lot of that. And we're not just talking about sitting back. I'm not dissident in my own country. I did read the article and I disagree. There are millions of things that are happening now to take them down. You want to look at the corporations. Some of those corporations fall into the trap because they're allowed to by external revenue streams from outside the country. Hollywood's a great example of why that happens. So what you have to do is make it painful for them. Republicans have not done enough to make it painful for them to do what they're doing in addition to the external revenue streams that they have. But you also saw the New York Times through the gendarme of the uh, corporate media trying to stop uh, put the, put up a list of corporations that refuse to sign the letter or to become inject themselves into partisan political politics. And 57% of the country agrees with us that they should not be doing this. So it's not that far away and it's not that difficult. And eventually it's going to come back to haunt them. You've even seen where Coke and Delta also started to back off of what they did with Georgia when the truth started to come out. So it's not a dissident in my own country. I refuse to have the left brainwash me into thinking that I am. It's the left that is a minority in this country. They are controlling parts of the elite, which may make it seem as if they run the country, but in fact, they do not. And the so way, we wait, take it to the American people and we fix it. The communists were never the majority in Eastern Europe. They were never the majority in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. It does, like, we can line up. We have more of us. We're the silent majority. Well, congratulations. The silent majority controls nothing. We don't control academia. We don't control entertainment. We don't control. Uh, we don't control Congress. We don't control the White House. We don't control the media. Like they control everything. So, like, congratulations. There's more of us worker bees than there are of them. But to show for it so far, I, I just don't know what we have to show for this. So we're magic not there. Eastern Europe. We have a constitution. We have constitutional rights. If they want to infringe it, it'll be eventually pushed back on the election. This is what happens in this country. We're certainly better off than we were in the 1970s and before Ronald Reagan came. I mean, we've never had and basically control of the media. We've never had control of academia in my lifetime. What have we ever had control of? It? We still have Republican majorities. In fact, in 2014, we had the highest number of elected Republicans we've ever had. We still have the Supreme Court, hence the reason they're trying to court that. They're acting out of desperation, not out of strength. This is why HR1 was the first thing they did rather than do the, uh, the COVID relief. Why did they do HR1? Why would they be dumb enough to put HR1, their own partisan rigging of the elections, as the first thing they do when they got a majority? They got away with that's the one thing that scares them the most. Because they got away with it in 2020. So why not let, make the changes in 2020 permanent? Of course, like, why would they do it? Why would they talk about court packing? Like, do you think they're honestly afraid of backlash from court packing? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, but I also think a lot of those issues are signaling to their most progressive side because that's they have to still keep those people happy because they're the only ones that they can count on. So I don't even think they care either way whether the radical stuff passes. It's that they have to make an effort to keep the progressive, like extreme progressive side happy. And I, I mean, I kind of, I guess, agree more with Thaddeus on the majority part, and this is why, you know, I wrote like January 7, like a lot of people, the first thing I wanted to do was listen to Rush because I wanted to see like this, like larger picture and Rush always has been, you know, positive just because he says, I still believe America's not lost because I believe in Americans. And it, it is really frustrating to not see, you know, the 57% that are, um, you know, dissidents as far as like the media and the institutions are concerned. But the other part, Republicans and, you know, conservatives and all of these, you know, common sense people, we also don't act like we're the majority. We're always being, you know, put upon. And part of that is because it is, you know, institutions that are coming down on us. But, um, 
you know, I think it, it helps <laughs> if you act like you're the majority and act like this is like a small minority that's pushing this, this crazy idea. And we hardly ever do that. We talk about being put upon by corporations instead of laughing at them, making fun of how little power they must have if they have to give in to like five Twitter accounts that the New York Times has. Well, I, I, I agree that they're the minority when you, I mean, still when you poll people in this country, there's only about 20 to maybe 23, 25% at most self identifies as like super left wing or, or quote unquote, very liberal. Well, yeah, um, I mean, and progressive is even a relatively new word because they only started using that when poll after poll showed no one wants to call themselves a liberal. Yeah. Why do they run everything then? Why do they run everything? Like I feel like there's this this this, this huge amount. No, they do. That's see, that's that's the problem. They're I mean, the my, they're can't... the minority with 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 regard to the voting block, and their ideas are unpopular. We know mm -hmm. that because they, they can't get anything passed through legislation, which is why they resort to working with corporations as well as through the courts. But this is the problem. This is where they get all their power. They've taken okay. over every fucking institution in America except AM radio, and and that's on us. Yeah. That's our problem. That's it's our like, fault. We ceded this war to them 35 years ago by saying, oh, we're above pop culture. We're above music. We're above art. We're above, you know, we, we withdrew from the culture war. And, and what did it get us? It allowed other people to go out and create this stuff. And, you know, you know, uh, amazingly enough, we don't like it. So uh, it is what it is. They're, they're powerful because they have control of these institutions. And we can't deny that. Right. But like, but like Coke, Coke, Coke isn't because we retreated from being involved in the corporate world. Like we spent the last 20 Coke. years kissing the corporate world's ass. The Republican Party was a whore for corporate America. And the payoff for having been the cheapest slut on the entire like, world is that they screw us over the exact first opportunity they can. Like, well, how do you explain? It's not that we didn't retreat from corporate boardrooms. Like, yes, you're right. When it comes to the pop culture, we have no one to blame but ourselves for having retreated from those culture wars. Like, no one to blame. But how do you explain what happened in boardrooms all across this country? How did how did it go that we were we we have been we have been the reliable votes to do everything they want to do at every turn for corporate America, and at the first opportunity, corporate America tosses us under the bus. Look at I mean the MLB. Look at the NBA. I mean look they they want they want they see a billion customers. You know, and, and this this is I think this is kind of the, the argument right now is it people call it capitalism. I don't see it as capitalism. I see it as corporatism. Um, you know, I go back to what John Mackey said. You have to, you know, ca capitalism have to, has to have a conscience. It can't just be about the bottom line because there are cultural things at stake. You know, you know, Chris, you and I talked about this. What do you think about when you think of Coca-Cola? I think Americana. I think Norman Rockwell. You said Max Headroom. <laughs> You know, c -c -c catch the wave. I mean, that was that was huge, man. I mean, but they're not interested in us anymore. There's only 340 million of us. There's a billion Chinamen over there, and I use that term because You're not allowed to use it anymore. Apparently. It offends people. Absolutely, I'll call them Orientals too. You know, and they'll, they'll say that you know they're not rugs, Brett. Um, but seriously, they want customers. There's more customers over there. It's the same with the MLB. I mean, America's pastime sold out America because they want Chinese meet in the seats because there's more of them over there. And we talked about this with Amanda Milius on another episode of Political Punks. The reason why they make these movies at this point, which mainly accounts to man being chased by monsters, is because that will appeal to a global audience. Whereas you don't get Die Hard, you don't get Lethal Weapon, you don't get Predator, you don't get any of these fun 80s action movies anymore because those only appeal to American audiences. Actually, it reminds me, like, I, I wonder how many of these corporations do believe what they're saying and how much is A, trying to appeal to a group, uh, or B, just not get boycotted. Um, this with, there's all these examples where, like, Disney will have some new progressive film out, you know, then you'll see what the billboard looks like in America, and then in China or in Asia, they might edit out the black people that are on the billboard, or if it's in the Middle East, they'll edit out a yeah. scene as a gay kiss or something. Well, or, they, did or, that, like, they did that with Star Wars with yeah, uh, John, yeah. John Boyega. They, they took him out of the movie poster. And, yeah. and that's something that people don't, I, I think in America, it's lost on people. 
um, and we saw a little bit during COVID, the Chinese are unbelievably racist against black people. They really don't like black people. They were kicking black people out of restaurants and out of their homes during COVID. Um, I mean, you talk to anybody who's been to China or knows people in, you know, on the mainland, they'll tell you they, they don't like black people. Um, but at the same time, the NBA has no problem with this because it's all about bucks. You know, and as I like to say, you know, no, you know, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's about the bottom line at this point, and, and, that's all, and that's all there is. Well, it's even worse. They're committing genocide against the Uyghurs. Hmm. This is a genocidal communist regime, and corporate America has no problem with it. One of the things I would love to see uh, enacted over time, because look, as a matter of math, you, the left has never liked corporate America. They'll take their money, and there are corporatist Democrats, but as a whole, the vast majority of the progressive base and others cannot stand corporate America. And we'd love to see it punished, the Elizabeth Warren type. What's, what's fundamentally changed is the Republican Party is going back to its Teddy Roosevelt trust-busting roots because now we can't stand them either. I never could myself. The voting records have proved it. But what you're going to see now is you have both sides know have the corporations in their sites to bring them to heel to make them more responsive to the American people. Now we may differ on what that constitutes, but there's going to become massive changes to the American corporate structure over time. They've sealed that deal because as you guys have rightly pointed out, their natural defenders are now gone because they've alienated them, which was the Republican party. And good luck finding enough progressives not to try to bring them to heel. I would think a nice bipartisan measure which should be proposed is no American airline, such as United or Delta or others, should be able to take a member of the Chinese Communist Party on a plane if they participated or abetted the genocide of the Uyghurs. That's very simple. That would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's fair Why enough. Why would you allow one of those types of people to fly on an American on an American plane? Well, I how about Congress how about trying to do that? I mean, right off they, the bat, weren't they, weren't they filming movies near where the Uyghur camps were? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how is Hollywood? I mean, why, why are we not sanctioning Hollywood for doing business and filming where there's genocide going on? And, and I also want to make another point. You said they're a genocidal communist re communist regime. Is there any other kind? <laughs> genocidal. Yeah. Yeah. They kill I, you know, everybody. Right. Yeah. Right. That's that's why I laugh at people. You know. Uh, you know. As a as a caveat here, <laughs> Patrice Collier's this uh, BLM the the. Uh, the admitted Marxist, everybody's flipping out about the fact that she's a millionaire and she has all these houses. And I'm like, everybody's ignorant to communism here. This, well, this is, this is, this is par for the course. There's two sets of classes in communism, rich and powerful and poor. She's a part of the rich and powerful class. Well, this is what they do. Hello, McFly, anybody the funniest, home? The funniest part about this, and this kind of been a buried lead. I mean, her whole thing is solidarity with her community. And when she comes in contact with money, she decides to move to a town that's ninety percent white and one percent black. Same so with like, so. I mean, what what kind of hypocrisy is that? Same with Barack Obama. Same with yep. uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright. They all live in yep. gated communities that are ninety eight percent white. Yep. Maxine Waters. All these people they live in white areas. They don't, they don't live amongst the people they represent. So. Maxine Waters didn't even live in the district she represents. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking of the district, I think I've lived in the D.C. area too much. When I heard that that woman's house was like 1.4 million, I was like, what is the big deal? <laughs> <laughs> it's all very relevant I mean, out there. Have four of them, it makes a difference. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, do we want to transition into a little uh, Mick Jagger and Dave Grohl? At this point? Point OK, so <laughs> just good. Yeah, these guys. Good point. <laughs> okay, so I was excited that uh, that Mick Jagger and Dave Grohl, two guys that I like, I, you know, I'm a huge Stones fan. Um, I, you know, I like I like all three iterations of the Stones. Thaddeus, you and I talked about this. You know, you've got the Brian Jones, you've got Mick Taylor, and then you've got Ronnie Wood. They're all different. It's it's very similar to Van Halen and Van Hagar. They're, to me, they're two different bands. Either way. I love the Stones and I love Mick Jagger. I even like some of Mick Jagger's solo stuff. It's been it's it's very good. And Dave Grohl, not a huge Foo Fighters fan. I was a big Nirvana fan. I like the first Foo Fighters album. Everything since then is just kind of blah to me. Either way, they came together, they teamed up, and they did this uh, song, and it's about the pandemic. And at first, I was like, "All right, awesome." You know, it, like 
a boomer and a Gen Xer come together to keep rock alive. Like this is awesome. Gene Simmons has been saying for years that rock is dead, but you know, and it kind of is. But um, I was excited about this, and then I learned that this is like a this is like a pro vaccine song, and it's all about getting out of the lockdown and how there's going to be like you know uh, heaven on earth and all this stuff. And it's called Easy Sleazy, which sounds like a Stone song. It sounds like any Stone song at this point, but like. I have not listened to the song because once I heard the topic of the song, it made me sick. And then it also made me think about how during the lockdown, the only two guys, the only the, the two biggest dissenters was Eric Clapton and Van Morrison. They got together and did a song, but it was an anti-lockdown song. They were saying, this is wrong. This is bullshit. You know, you're throwing away your rights. Um, I, you know, it, it's funny. And, and then they got a rash of shit from everybody about that. Like everybody kind of distanced themselves from them. But um, what do we think about this? Well, I was uh, wondering what Dave Grohl was going to have to say about this, so I'm glad uh, to put it on record. Um, I got to be honest, I just don't care. I don't know why. The thing is, if you're so easily influenced by a celebrity like this, wouldn't you have been influenced already by now? Like, we've been getting this messaging since there was a vaccine, so what's the point? So is it really is it working? working? Is this message work? Is this messaging working? Well, coming it from works on people who were, like, remember I think Frank Zappa said this famously, that in politics the only people you convince are people who are already agreed with you? It's kind of like that. Nah. I, no, no it's not one I don't new think person. any of these things are for, I mean, anytime they do something like farm aid or um, any of that type of stuff, none of it is for fans or listeners it's right. a pr move it's just strictly a pr move that is calculated by managers and all these you know other people like within an, an entourage but the, the, I don't even the think they expect expect to do it i mean that's why they have all these people doing like psas about like wear a mask or get vaccinated or do this or do that i mean it's a pr move more than i think them literally thinking they can mobilize anybody on, on these things. I mean, because most people, it's like one of those issues that sounds so like polarizing, like people believe what they believe. The left, the, the left kills everything they touch. Comedy's, yeah. not, comedy's not funny anymore because the left has killed it. Like TV's not watchable anymore because the left has killed it. There are no good movies coming anymore because the left has killed it. Music sucks because I'm only listening to people who've been canceled. So I'm, it's Morgan Wallen and Hank Williams III. I had just a constant like- Did they, wait, wait, wait. Did they, cancel, did they cancel Hank 3? I mean, look, half of Hank's albums have the uh, Confederate battle flag on it. So yeah. I, think, I think it was Hank was canceled probably 10 years ago. What was that? He's got an album called, uh, what's it called? Uh, Rebel Proud or something like yeah, that. Yeah. The Hank. only stone shirt I have has the Confederate flag on it. Oh, like, that's so <laughs> Actually, awesome. Actually, speaking of stones, that is, do you remember? I, I don't know if I bought it or you just gave it to me, but you did like a slate tile. Um, yeah, with the Union Jack and yeah, yeah, but not the Confederate flag. No, no, that's a, that was a t shirt, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it the only Stones thing I have, I mean, I had like Confederate flag, I had the Union Jack, I, it must be from like an album cover or something. But, um, well, Union Jack and Confederate flag are different. I know that. Oh, so is it the Union Jack or is it the Confederate flag? <laughs> both. Oh, it's both. Okay, I'm from Tallahassee, yeah, I, I Florida. That. I, I don't even blink when I see a Confederate flag. I, I think of the. I think uh, look. I didn't my even notice cool. it was on there until it. It you know it wasn't supposed to be on there. But one thing I think, and we talked about this with in the last one is, as far as like people getting canceled. I mean, they they might be getting canceled by corporate music or corporate media or whoever. But I mean, and and comedy stuff. But there are other places where these people are going. I mean, Andrew Schultz who. You know, I met on like through Red Eye, and I, I did an episode with them. I mean, he went outside of the Netflix machine and did like his own special that he posted. I can't remember if it was on YouTube or even just like on his website, and it did so well, even though it was you know so cancelable that Netflix eventually came to him. I mean, he's been on Joe Rogan talking about it, and he just came. He just filmed a music video with some country guy in Florida called "Open Her Up." And it's under the guise of, you know, like being like this girly type of song, but he did it in Florida. They're talking about open up the economy, but he's not doing it from a, you know, political standpoint. Cause at the end of the day, he's a comedian. He's not, he, he's definitely not a conservative. I don't, he's, and he's probably apolitical. I think we don't give entertainers 
enough credit for the fact that a lot of them really just are apolitical. Um, but there are things, and it's, it's our, it was number one on iTunes the day it came out. It's within the top 100 within the whole world on, on iTunes and on other things. But we, we've like, it, it goes back to, I think, being in the minority. And that's that we're letting people say, you can cancel us when really there's lots of other streams where people are going um, and still being successful. Like who even knows? I haven't, if I looked at like a billboard 100 right now with the, except for the fact that Janet Jackson rhythm nation jumped on it, like for some random reason, a couple like weeks ago, I wouldn't know any of it. That's a good. Well, album. and by the way, more after Morgan Wallen got canceled, his album was number one for six consecutive weeks after he got canceled. And by the way, he's not being played by any corporate mm -hmm. radio, like any of the iHeart radio stations. None of them are playing him. Like, you know, they can't play his music anywhere on, you know, at the ACMs, nothing. And but you go to look at the top fifty Billboard country songs right now, Morgan Wallen's got like eight of them. Like, you know, so you're right. There, like there are, but but again, like Jesus Christ, we're talking about country music. <laughs> I mean, you know, like we yeah, can't. I think there's that. other there's you, other where, things. I mean, where's the battle lines at? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, not, not, but it's yeah. not country music because he's not a country. It's a well. First of all, it's a it's a rap song. He did it with a country guy, but he's not a conservative. No, he's not he, a country singer. He's you know a comedian. Um, that yeah, and I, my, and that, my point, yeah, that's my just point. like sort of the like, example. No, I mean, that was my point was that like we there are places where people are fighting back against cancel culture, mm -hmm. uh, but like the most obvious example I can think of again is Morgan Wallen, and that's in the country music realm. And Jesus, like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, like that's if you if you can't fight back against woke culture in the country music world, then like I, I don't know where we ever can do it. Well, I, they'll, they'll, they'll stake their claws into that as well. But I mean, look, I, I'm, I, I'm an example of cancel culture after Clinton cash graphic novel people, clients that I worked for, for 25 years, including Marvel and DC comics stopped answering my emails. I mean, I mean, everything went dark, everything. Um, I had to and scramble. But, but now you're doing the same type of thing, but at a higher level and probably making yeah. more money because more just like how I always say, like technology is basically what, you know, gave women more freedom than ever before. I mean, mm -hmm. technology and different revenue streams and doing all these types of things are what's gonna hopefully eventually make the concept of being canceled like well, move. <laughs> you, you either you either accept being canceled and you go drive a bus for Amazon or you know uh, you know a, a truck for Amazon or do whatever, or you you keep doing what you're doing. And it's the same with Gina Carano. So what if she's not going to get hired by? mainstream Hollywood, there are other ways to make films. And that's kind of what I discovered. There's other ways to go out and continue to do what you want to do. And maybe it'll even lead to bigger and better things like it did for me. So um, well, and I'm also yeah. not, I mean, even though it, it sucks, like if you're an entertainer, an artist or something in that community, I'm not as worried about those types of people being canceled than a truck driver who tweeted something and then a mob of three Twitter people get him fired. Right. right. Hey, speaking of canceling, uh, I have to cancel myself and head to a family dinner. So I, All right. you know, but uh, we, I guess we'll be on for next week or two weeks or yeah. something. Matt, I, I want to say something. I'm incredibly yes. proud to have you on this show because you're quoting Frank Zappa. Okay, well, I'm very I, proud of you, brother. To you, be fair, I, I just saw it on a meme in Facebook, so it's not that. <laughs> no, he was he was. Know. Ardently anti-communist. He was on CNN many times on Crossfire. He was an admitted conservative. Um, there's tons yeah. of great stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's a fascinating guy. Fascinating guy and just a musical genius. Absolute musical genius. So anyway, we'll have you back. Thanks right. for Let's thanks for stopping by. Later, brother. Thanks. Good to see you guys. Do we know if he saw it on the internet? Do we know it was Frank Zappa and not like Thomas Sowell or something? And they just put a, a picture of Frank Zappa on it. <laughs> It's a, it sounded like it sounded like a Frank <laughs> quote to me, to be honest. Not that um, Tom Soul isn't cool, but you know, you know, some, something else. When Chris, Chris, you were talking about, um, um, you know, kind of sidestepping, you, you know, sort of the mainstream entertainment, uh, and and going straight to straight straight to the customer and being uh, successful. I think about Metallica. Metallica operated for, gosh, how many albums before they got radio airplay? It wasn't until Injustice for All in 1988 with. 
the single of one and it was the one video that they had. That was kind of the fun part about Metallica. They had one video and like, what song did they do? And you say one. And it's like, huh? You know, people who didn't know the band would be like, what? But they, all their songs were too long. I mean, like, like the shortest song is probably like six minutes, you know, and, and radio at that point was looking for two minute, 50 second, three minute songs, maybe four at most. The only two songs that I know that they would play that were that long was probably like Layla. If they kept the instrumental in, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they let the birds chirp at the end, sometimes they don't. But then there's also um, Freebird, you know, which has got what, like an 11 minute guitar solo or something. So, you know, you know, Metallica was able to do it without radio airplay, without MTV. And it's kind of like, how did they do that? And they did it by touring. They were just absolute machines. And they toured and they toured and they toured and they built this huge army. They sold all these albums and it, it's possible. It's possible. Even Alex Van Halen, I've got, I had this great quote from Alex Van Halen where he said, you know, the, the music industry is just, it's a mess. You know, back in the day, you'd get a dollar per record and now you get 50 cents for every 250,000 streams or, or, you know, the, every time they play a particular song. And he said, so it's wrong. It doesn't make any sense. And now everything's gone back. The only way you can really make money is playing live, which, and so he said, it's ironic that it's gone back. Which has been taken away and makes, makes a lot of people more dependent on the corporate aspect. Right. Yep. Right. I mean, yeah. The, the, the corporate aspect, I mean, remember, we're the entrepreneurial party anyways. We're entrepreneurial in terms of not only the economy, politically. Uh, there's a corporate atrophy that takes place, especially amongst in this time of crony socialism in which we find ourselves. So to a certain extent, uh, we're ahead of the curve because sooner or later, it's going to be much more of an entrepreneurial environment, which is one of the things that actually I find promising about Gen Z, some of the millennials is that if, if you look at some of the economic policies that they do support, you don't say they're a Republican, they support them. <laughs> so I think that what you're finding is, like with the bands going back to having to tour to actually to meet their fans, to product, to be their own uh, PR man, the A&R person, the producers, now you, the things you, you can do, do at all are amazing. It's just amazing what you can do. So it's we're, we're heading into an even more entrepreneurial environment whereby I think we're going to be very successful. And I think the cancel culture will be lost. That's why I think big tech and the rest of them and Amazon are, are so deathly afraid of things like parlor, so deathly afraid of the free flow of information, just like the left is, because it allows the empowerment to continue with individuals to extend undreamt in human history. You have more power right now in, in, in a phone than people have had for millennia to control their own lives and make their own decisions and have their own voices heard. So I think we we tend to look at the negative aspect of the time in which we live, but I tend to look forward. And I think a lot of the institutions that have lost their credibility and that are disintegrating in front of us are just ultimately going to prove to be a good thing. When I was, yeah. on, I was, on, a, I was on a panel this past weekend at Trump Doral with Nick Searcy, uh, and Bettina Viviano and yep. Robbie Starbuck talking about entertainment. I think one of the things that they finally have have comp like understood is that you can't work within the existing system. That you're going to have to build all of the like individual components. Like you're going to have to you're going to have to. It's not just like somebody out there writing good scripts because no one's going to buy them. And as we even as we saw from the run hide fight, like even if you have a good movie made, there's no distribution for it. So it's it finally people understand that you've got to all, all of this has to be replicated because we can't we can't rely Hollywood's never going to come back around. Like it's so the only way is building these new completely new systems, which I, I agree with you. I, I think it's a, because we are the entrepreneurial group, because we're the, like, I, I, that drive is there. Like, I mean, Nick Searcy's doing like the Lord's work every day, like, you know, building this stuff from scratch and understanding that like, I can't, I can't just wait for Hollywood to all of a sudden get its head out of its ass. Cause it's never, never going to happen. Hollywood's never going to like us. You know, well, and we're entrepreneurial, especially when, when it comes to that type of stuff and the pop culture stuff. But we're also like as a group have very little patience for building anything, you know, <laughs> which, is <the> downside, which, <laughs> which is the downside. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like I wish I had more like I was on the plane and I ordered a, a Coke Zero and I was like, 
damn it, why well, order a Coke? I'm not, I can't, I can't drink Coke. I like, ordered a Coke Zero because I like Coke Zero. You know what I mean? Like, well, we no, but, well, I mean, as far as like investing. Drink Dr. Pepper, please. Investing. Drink Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you do such a, the other side does such a good job. Of, well, and the, but I mean, of looking at the, at the long view. No, you and know, they I did, mean, one high fight could have been a total flop and not gotten, you know, Daily Wire, any new subscribers, and that would be it. Like yeah, conservatives I, I would be like, we can't, we don't, we don't do that. Let's stick to documentaries. Well, and the, by the way, so Bettina Viviano made a great point. She said that, like, uh, what we have to do is understand, like, in Hollywood, there may be nine out of the ten, like, like scripts that they greenlight are going to be flops. But like mm -hmm. the one that hits big, they don't care that the nine other flop. So they they can do nine awful horrible social justice warrior movies because they're going to have the one big hit that pays for it. We're such at a stage of infancy that like, do, like uh, you know, people who want to invest are like, well, how am I going to get my money back on this? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like if, if we're going to, if we're going to spend $40 million on a movie, like, well, how, how do I get my money back on this? Which is a, the left's not in that place. They're saying like, we'll hit on, you know, Spider-Man 17. Uh, mm -hmm. And it will pay for the 14 movies we're going to do about the transgendered Korean, you know, cripple girl who is looking to run away from home. Like, you know, like they, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't, you know what I mean? Like they, they, they can afford to do that. And we're still at that point where we're looking for, hey, give me money. Yeah, I'll give you oh, money. Why? But I can get back out of this. See, we, yeah. You know, this is Tom, to, to a certain extent, we are what we support. We are small business. We all are. We are entrepreneurs. And the one thing that we forget about, though, is our side's audience will be extremely loyal to products that are put out. And they don't even have to be. We're not talking about political products. We're just talking about apolitical products that are actually good and do what people like. <laughs> and that's, yeah, and that's how that's how run run hide fight wasn't a political movie. Like I didn't I didn't get done watching it and think like, oh my God, like I have like I'm so amped to be a conservative. I was just like, <sighs> that was a good movie. You know what I mean? And like Right. By the way, it also didn't like force feed me anti gun crap along the way. It was just a it was just a good movie, and that's what the other side has done so magnificently is that not that they have like fed us like prepare for liberal propaganda, you know? It's like <laughs> no, and, like they've been weaving this in to everything in pop culture. Whereas like too too often on our side, we're like, you ready for the next Kirk Cameron movie? Yeah. Like who wants to talk about Jesus in this next movie? Like, you know, so the only people who are tuning in for that stuff are already the like true believers where we need to have more product. That's like, as you pointed out, Congressman, like this just good, you know, that's not right. that's just good and is not selling us some anti-conservative crap. It's just, it's just good. Like I, I didn't watch Roseanne's show because I was going for like political commentary. It was just refreshing to watch a show that was good and was funny and showed a you know Trump voter as a human being. You know, it was like well, and also they and you know that they put in a lot of um, you know check box or boxes to check. You know, they had like the trans kid, they had the lesbian yep. mom, they had um, you know like all of these different things. But even with the one you know, normal Trump voter of, you know, Roseanne was too much. They had yep. to get rid of it. And that, I mean, to me, that's like one of those things that shows the power of what we have. But instead, we're just like, they but canceled they have fun. Yeah, Roseanne. They, 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 they were terrified. It's, it's the same reason why, look, Newsmax and OAN have almost no footprint right now compared to, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and they're terrified of OAN and Newsmax. There was like a new hit piece out today about it uh, on in BuzzFeed. I'm like, why are you guys so obsessed with this like tiny, tiny, because they know how powerful that message is. It's what they had to kill Roseanne because they couldn't have one show. So a Trump supporter as a normal person. They have to go after OAN and Newsmax because they can't have any outlets, no matter how niche, can't be out there challenging their control over the news and over facts as we know them. And you're right, Lisa. It's because we're actually that power. You know, 
we are that powerful. They they well, know. The same thing is happening now with Gutfeld back. You know, yep. he is beating like some late night shows. And the first thing that happens is last week, the Daily Beast has this yeah. ridiculous article quoting a bunch of anonymous people saying like, oh, here's a guy trying to get ahead at Fox News. Everybody says he was trying to get ahead. It's like, guess what? Anyone that wants to be on, on TV, uh, <laughs> they're probably, I mean, not that I believe all the quotes, but generally people that are on TV, you know, act the same way that he does. I'm not on TV. And when they were like, he doesn't talk to me in the elevator, I'm like, why would they? <laughs> and this article wouldn't exist if he, you know, if it wasn't a late night show on Fox News that happened to be doing that. It's not even that it's like so successful because as far as like the numbers, it's not like a huge amount of people. It's that it is worse because it also shows how little the normal late night audiences. I used to I used to tell people about Gottfeld. I said if Gottfeld was a liberal, he'd be hosting uh, the Late Show on CBS. Mm -hmm. yep. No yep. doubt about it. And the reason they go after the little fella is because I, I don't agree with this, but he's likable and he's funny. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, if, we, if they, if he, <laughs> if Tucker, if anybody wasn't, um, but, but I mean, with Greg, though, or convincing, there'd be no reason to go after them. But, but, but Tucker, Tucker, Tucker. Tucker's his opinion, but Gutfeld is likable. No, that's and what I'm saying. Person, like, if Tucker he wasn't effective, too, just like Mitch Anderson is, is likable and he's when funny all, and he can connect with people and they can't stand that. And ask yourself very simply when dealing with the left, the reason they got to censor us all the time is because they know their stuff doesn't work, their stuff is hated. And unlike us, we can live with different points of view because we know our, ours is better and it's been proven. Well, well, and every time like there is something all crazy, all like a Maxine Waters, I, well, I was just saying, we're the, the opposite, like like what you said, because when they say something that we're like, can you believe how crazy this is? We're like, give that person a microphone. We're sharing Maxine Waters all over the place. I mean, Absolutely. they haven't taken yeah. the videos down, but we want to amplify it. And they're like the opposite. We don't want anybody to see what they really think and that they're normal and funny and, you know, effective. Well, and I, I was just gonna say, like, for all, I mean, all of us did red eye. Like, how often did we talk politics on red eye? It was n n never like it, the reason why red eye was so effective and it, like, actually, in a way, like, so subversive was because it just showed a whole bunch of normal right of center folks talking about pop culture and crazy stories and laughing and having a good time. And that, that, that flew in the face of, and that's why they hate Gutfeld so much, flies in the face of what they want everyone to believe conservatives are like. They want to believe yeah. that like it, it's a whole bunch of angry people in their basement. I'm in my basement now with guns. I have guns. Um, so maybe I'm the wrong person. Uh, like, but that, that's, you know what I mean? Like, they, they, don't, they don't want us to be normal. Like it goes back to the Roseanne thing. Like it, it, yeah. they can't have us be normalized because if they show us as or humanized, people, yeah. It's hard to call your neighbor a racist and a bigot and all of these things when you see that they're not. <laughs> I mean, that was, and that's one of the reasons, like, you know, prior to, um, you know, CPAC and all of that stuff, one of, one of, I used to organize, um, you know, campus lectures with Ann Coulter and, and other people like that. And people would get so pissed off about her being allowed to speak. And it wasn't even necessarily because of, what they thought were like crazy quotes, it's that you can't silence laughter. When there's a room of 800 people and supposedly a majority of them dislike her, which is true because generally the protesters would be the ones that would come out. You can't stifle when you know your leftist friend next to you is laughing at a joke she said. That like causes like some sort of like well, humor. Brain freeze where it's humanizing people. And 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 that's like what goes back to, to red eye is you know, having people on that, you know, are funny and they're not the caricature that the left has has told people they are. Well, well if, so we're just, if, all we're just are crazy, if all you see are crazy people, you think they're sane. So <laughs> when they show normal people, conservatives and populists, you realize the left is completely batshit crazy. <laughs> well, it's, they just it's like Lisa, when you, when you tweeted out about how you were in line at Target, and I think you said it was a Latino cashier and it, like you wished her happy Easter. And she was like so excited. And you said, just a reminder, like we're the normal one. 
Yeah, and, and and you know, it got like all these leftists were like, more than like a majority of the world is not Christian. I'm like, I'm not telling you you have to have a, have a happy Easter. And I wouldn't mind if someone told me happy Ramadan. I'd be you know, insane to you. But yeah, the whole absolutely. point was that um, I like to, and what I had said to you, like on the DL, I didn't put in my tweet because I really didn't want to make it like a thing that's like my seven year old daughter said, you know, yeah. or asked me. Um, you know, is slavery gone now that, you know, Trump isn't president or whatever? And I didn't want to, to tweet it to make it into one of those, you know, <laughs> moments. But I I couldn't help but notice because she was Latino. And I'm sure um, just as like any corporation does, I mean, they probably don't normally want people to say Happy Easter or, or you know, any any holiday, even Happy Ramadan, right? And I w just kind of wonder what it must be like for this Latina cashier who comes to America and a corporation says, oh, and by the way, like we don't, you know, s say those types of things. <laughs> yeah, sure. And my, my only reason for tweeting that is that she wasn't offended and, you know, I didn't think she would be offended and I, I don't care if she was, but, at least but, it was but agree we are the, the normal world. ones. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Like that was, I read that and I was like, man, like sometimes it's hard for me to remember that, that like we are actually the normal ones, you know, yeah. like <laughs> nobody, like nobody gets mad when you wish them happy Easter. Okay. May, maybe one person, but that person's a lunatic, you know, the other. I mean, it would be like if I were like yeah. happy Saturday and then someone was like, I have to work on Saturdays. <laughs> yeah. By the way, guys. I hate to pull a mat here, but I got to go. I promised Sean that I would be gone for an hour and 20 minutes. I have to no finish problem. helping make this beehive. Like we're like- I got a beehive. Yeah, we'll I, kinda, know, I gotta yeah. go too. I gotta do I gotta do a couple of radio things, but I just gotta this tell way. Chris, I, I love the shirt. The Winnipeg Jets. Um, well, that old that is, school, did man. you I see Brett's hat? I love it. Huh? Brett, show your hat. I think Lisa's. Oh. oh, there you are. You're coming in and out. There you go. Oh, Brett, show your hat to Thaddeus. If you're oh. going to compliment clothing. Well, I mean, does I mean, he doesn't even, he doesn't even know what my hat is probably more than likely. Well, it's it is, Tigers. But, well, <laughs> well, it's Al's Automotive. Yeah, it's not the Tigers. And this, this is actually. It is the well. Tigers. It's, it's a Magnum PI hat. So I, I, I only wear Magnum PI hats. These are, these are made by a gal on Etsy who makes movie hats and movie props and then sells them. So she makes this one. And then she also made a Navy Steel one for me specifically recently, but it's like I'd wear the Dan Ang hat, but I didn't serve. You know the the famous Magnum hat that has the yeah. Dan but Ang. he was. I mean, he was. His character was supposed to be like a Detroit fan, right? It was. Well, he wore the Tigers hat. Yeah, that's right. the point. Yeah. Yeah, the only, the only thing the about getting locked down reference. in Michigan that I that I was happy about is it gave me a chance to watch every single Magnum PI episode. <laughs> nice. You know what? That show is so good, and and it really did. Um, the guy Don Belisario who produced it. Um, wanted to make a point in that show to paint Vietnam vets in a much more favorable light because as opposed to how they had been kind of portrayed and, um, and that show really did. I mean, it, it focused on vets a lot. It had a very beneficial effect. So that, that show is just, you know, part of what's fun about watching that show is that it's in Hawaii, you know, and it's kind of like, so you get to get, to get transported to the big Island for, you know, 48 minutes or whatever and hang out with Rick and TC and Thomas. It's pretty cool. All right. I got yeah. it. Thanks, guys. It's good to have a red-eye union. Thanks reunion. for having me, guys. Bye, everyone. Yeah, we'll Thanks do it again. Guys. Take it easy. Bye. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the thing I was going to say about Greg was also the fact that um, humor, humor, like, brings people together. And um, that's, that's why that show is such a threat, essentially. Yeah. So, all right. Well, since everyone is gone, <laughs> we'll just go ahead and log off. We're out of time. Everyone make sure and... Subscribe to Political Punk's channel on Rumble and YouTube so you never miss any of our new videos. Like and share this video far and wide. Also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, everyone keep the faith and stay frosty.